Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. Well, what you know, alibiers, hope you've had a great Thursday. I was going to have this episode out way earlier and I recorded the entire episode only to find that I didn't have my good mic selected in my software. I had my iMac speakers and it was terrible. And I tried literally for an hour to fix it when I could have just been done. So I'm just redoing this. You know, it's been a hot minute since I've recorded an episode with like the mic muted. So it was time for some kind of a screw up like this. It's all right. You got to laugh, right? Jimmy Buffett said, if we wouldn't laugh, if we couldn't laugh, we would all go insane. All right. Thanks to Betty for the donation. And today's music fact really isn't a music fact, but I came across this on my Facebook memories today. When my daughter was three and a half, my youngest was three and a half or four. She loved the song Tiny Dancer. And she would always sing Count the Headlights on the highways. So in the comments, tell me some of your funniest misheard lyrics. I want to hear it. We are going to dive right back into part four of the crash course. And some people have asked, well, why is it taking you so long to get through this? You know, you just forget how deep this case goes. And believe me, what I've left out from where we are now is a ton. So for those of you that are interested in the full story, I have the Connecting the Dots series that's nearly done. The only thing left to do on that is some core updates. But the bulk of the story is, is there. It's all just what's happened in court. And I'm going to make it a very quick, maybe one episode to finish that out. After trial, I will have to add some episodes as we learn things and kind of insert them. Not sure how I'm going to do that, but we will figure it out. Might do a whole new playlist with just what we've learned. All right. February 1st, this all takes place in 2019. And this gets into the snowball effect of from January when all of a sudden Lori freaks out and says she's leaving Charles. And so February 1st, Lori finally checks herself into Community Bridges. And guess what? A few hours later, she's gone. She's discharged. She texts Charles and tells him that his truck is behind the Hyatt Hotel and his clothes were in boxes by the garage. Melanie Gibb spoke to Nate Eaton from East Idaho News and said, Lori said she passed with flying colors. I waited on the outside for her. Tylee was the one that picked us up from there. They went in the back room and they talked to her about all kinds of stuff. She didn't tell me in detail all the things and I probably didn't want to know. Now, if you're on YouTube, real quick, if you look to the left of me, you will see pictures and names. And since a lot of people are very new to this story, I thought it would be good, you know, four episodes in, a, it kind of clicked, to have pictures with names. And I kind of put couples side by side as much as I could. And so that way, maybe it'll make it a little easier. If you have any other suggestions of how I could do that, that you think would work better, let me know. I'm always open to suggestions. So February 4th and 5th, Lori gets two new phone numbers and she texts Zulema that this is her new number and to use it. Charles also files that order of protection against Lori and they're only supposed to communicate through text and only discuss parenting and financial issues. She was restricted from coming to the residence on Tomahawk Drive that's a different house than the one Charles was murdered in, by the way. She was allowed one deputy to accompany her to get her belongings. And on February 8th, Charles files for divorce. February 10th, after this whole mess with Charles, Lori disappears for 72 days. She leaves JJ with Charles, just totally disappears from his life. Now, we know Tylee is with her at least for some of this time because they go to Hawaii. Lori and Tylee go to Hawaii. When they land, Lori calls her friend, April Raymond. They bonded there. April is, a, is divorced. Lori had been divorced. So that was something they had in common. And they just had a lot of things that they did together and seemed to be really good friends while Lori was living on the island with Charles, Tylee, and JJ. And for a bit, Colby, but he did move back. She said Lori and Tylee stayed with her for less than a week and Lori tells April she's leaving Charles and tells her all about these podcasts she's doing, tells April that her friend Zulema can control the elements 
And April was on Dateline and told Keith Morrison that Lori seemed different, very disorganized and a little bit manic. Lori told April that she thinks that April is one of the 144,000 chosen ones and Lori is there to gather her. And another thing, she would have to leave her kids behind there. And so April was like, yeah, hard pass. No, thanks. Lori tells April about Chad's books and also said April. April said Lori and Tylee went to a resort for about 30 days, she thought, after they left her place. She also told investigators on January 7th of 2020 that when Lori lived on the island, she was a good mom. She was productive and helpful to everyone and that she would trust Lori with her children. But the Lori she saw in February of 2019 was very different. She was talking about the 144,000. And Lori also said Charles was already dead because he had demons living inside him. And Lori said she was expecting a call any day that Charles was dead. She also said Charles had become violent and April just didn't buy it. She knew Charles and knew he was a, a good guy. They called Charles the Disneyland dad because he liked to have fun with kids. She also told Keith Morrison that Lori had several phones while she was there and she was fumbling through them. One would ring, so she would have to kind of fumble them all around to figure out which one was ringing. And Tylee at one point even said, Mom, you look like a drug dealer with all your phones. She had pages of doctrine and list of categories that people belonged in. And she was talking about, <laughs> oh Lord, she's talking about different celebrities and their lightness and their darkness. And she was anxious to tell me who the darkest spirit on the planet was. And she said it was Oprah Winfrey. Lori, what you got against Oprah? Come on, man. this is crazy. Lori tells another friend in Hawaii that she and Tylee had a key to Joe Ryan's apartment. And after not hearing from him for a month or so, they went to check on him and found him dead. Now, this is weird because we covered in a previous episode that a neighbor noticed there were flies around the door. The dog went kind of was going to that door and there was a, a bad odor coming. So they had to have maintenance from the apartment complex come open the door and that employee found him dead which is just very odd. I don't know if that's a sympathy thing or if it's true and they just shut the door and left and didn't tell anybody who knows. Lori and Zim Zulema are also texting about all the powers they have. February 11th, Charles withdrew JJ out of his school in Arizona and told them that Lori had disappeared and that she had gone crazy. He also let them know about the order of protection he had filed against her. So JJ's school in return files a report with cps or like child protective services as it's called here and they let them know that Lori's disappeared and that charles had an order of protection against her so on february 15th for the first time Lori's brother alex refers to charles as ned in a text saying ned was at the temple yesterday looking for you he thinks you're staying with me Lori does not respond to that text February 20th, someone calls Charles's life insurance company asking for a change of beneficiary form. He calls again the same day explaining he wanted to set up a PIN code on his account. Now, six days later, on February 26th, Charles calls Banner Life to change the password, and the password was wrong. He said he never set a password and was worried someone had fraudulently accessed his account. He said he wanted to change the beneficiary to his sister Kay, and also lets them know about the order of protection against Lori. So they send him another form to fill out. On March 2nd, Lori and Zulema text about their bodies changing. Y'all, this is the most ridiculous thing ever. They're super excited they have their periods again. And also about changes in their breasts and things like that. I mean, celebrating getting that stuff again. That tells you right there. Fifty Shades of Grey. There's also a forwarded message to Lori from Alex that came from their mom. And in this message, the mom, Janice, is defensive of Charles and kind of takes a side about why he, to them, is acting out. He's not acting out. He's trying to get their attention to get her help. But she says Lori has Charles's bank account drained. She canceled his flight. His clothes are gone. And Lori would be upset if he did that to her. 
She also says Charles never did anything but support her and acknowledges Charles will keep the cell phones active, allow Lori to stay in the house when he moves out, and says she hasn't heard from Lori, you know, because at this point, Lori's kind of disappeared. Now, one thing to know, if you're new to the case, Charles largely kept up Lori's family in certain ways, like cell phones, iPads, if they had the data, the cell phone data. And also with Colby, Colby lived with Charles and Lori after he got married and they gave him a car and things like that. Alex texts Lori that Ned came by his place and Tylee unleashed on him. He said Charles was driving a rental car. And again, Lori did not respond to that, that text messages. So on March 1st, Charles files to dismiss the divorce proceedings. And then on March 2nd, Charles goes to Lori's sister Summer's house, as well as Alex's house looking for Lori. So March 3rd, this is the first time investigators find that Lori traveled to Idaho. On March 5th, she flies back to Arizona. And on March 6th, the court formally withdraws Charles's divorce petition. On the 7th of March, Charles takes JJ out of the school and he called and asked for a copy of his IEP to be put in his backpack and they go to Houston. Now, an IEP, if you're not familiar, it's for kids that have struggles in school and so it sets goals for them and all year you work towards those goals. It tells where they're at. And then the goal for where the, the school wants them to be by the end of the year, making progress to towards that goal. You have a lot of meetings during the year for IEPs and things like that. It's a really good, uh, really good roadmap for kids that need a little extra help. So on March 9th, Charles emails Lori and says he wants to establish a family connection with her and JJ. He notes it's been 38 days since she made any contact with either him or JJ. He said if it makes her feel better to make accusations against him, he can't stop her. But he says they both know it's ridiculous and that she has been his one and only for 14 years. So remember, Lori's telling her family and probably everybody that he's got women he's keeping up in California and all that jazz. Charles says he will have all of his stuff out of their house on March 15th and then she can have it back on the 16th. He's going to pay the bills and he says we can work out a visitation schedule with JJ. And then he offers to pay for a locksmith after he moves out to come and change those locks for her. He was too nice. He was too good to her, too trusting that maybe she would she would do the right thing. Bless his heart. But he asked her to let him know by March 11th whether or not she's good with this plan. He says, after 38 days, the only conclusion he can draw is that Lori and her family want no contact with JJ and said that is her choice. He said both he and JJ are really sad and his heart hurts for JJ. He said, you are his mother and he misses you. Then he ends the email asking her to please agree to see JJ. The same day, Lori texted Alex. Apparently, it's tied to Ned being gone, hopefully today or tomorrow. So I believe that kind of means that she's anticipating he is going to die today or tomorrow. Y'all, I just got freaked out. I'm going to show you. So we have this thing in Greenville called Mice on Main. It's part of the Goodnight Moon thing. And so you can go through downtown and find these all over. There's a little treasure map. And I just glanced because my cats have been bringing me gifts and I thought I had a mouse on my desk, but it's just the bronze little mouse from downtown Greenville. My heart's beating. Not even going to lie. March 10th, Alex responds to Lori, love you too. Have fun and get rid of Ned already. Do mom and shish, which I believe is maybe like sister Summer, know about Ned? Lori says, it's not Ned. It's a new one. Talking about a new entity. Remember, there was Ned, there was Garrett, and then Iplos was the final one. March 19th through the 21st, Chad and Lori fly from Idaho Falls to Mesa Airport together on the same flight. March 19th, Charles emails Lori again and says, it's been 49 days since you've contacted me or JJ. He says he'll keep the house until the end of April, and she didn't respond to that first email. Charles says JJ is doing great. He's taking his own tubby, which I assume is a bath, washing his own hair and putting on his PJs. Charles says before bed, JJ sits on his lap and will put himself to sleep. And I think it's really 
big to point out here that JJ, it seems, had a lot of normalcy in the 70 some odd days that Charles had him and Lori was out of the picture. And it's really sad that this divorce didn't go through. I, although I'm not convinced. I think even if they had gotten divorced, they were they were they were planning to do something with Charles. But he also says that JJ got his first real haircut and says it's adorable. He also says that JJ is having a lot of fun with his cousins and new friends. He says JJ really misses Tylee, but it was Lori's choice to separate the two. At that point, he said JJ was being homeschooled with a teacher who was experienced in special needs. He says he wants what's best for JJ, and having his mother in his life is crucial to his well-being and his development. He begs her to see JJ, or at least call, because he said JJ misses her terribly and just doesn't understand where she is. He ends the email saying, please say or do something for him. He deserves it and puts please in all caps. So March 25th, around this time, Tylee is staying at Alex Cox's, Lori's brother's place. Now, Alex is a trucker, so I think she was there by herself a lot of the time. Apparently, at this point, Lori had not had a lot of contact, really none with Tylee for a while. She wasn't answering Tylee's texts or anything like that. Sometime in the spring, Melanie Gibb was on the phone with Lori, and she heard Lori call Tylee a zombie. Tylee overhears this and says, not me, Mom. This arose out of Lori requiring Tylee to babysit JJ, and Tylee didn't want to. Lori also told Melanie Gibb that Tylee had turned into a zombie when she was around 12 or 13 and was difficult to work with around the same time. Girlfriend, welcome to having a teenage daughter, okay? That's a tough time. At 12 to 13, they are all difficult. March 26, Alec texts Lori, Ned is still alive, just confirmed. And Lori responds, it's not Ned, it's a new one. March 27th, Brandon, which is Melanie's ex-husband, they're there on the screen on the very bottom. He tries to call Charles, but it doesn't go through. Now, much later, after Charles's murder, Brandon finds out that Charles's number was blocked on his phone. His son had possession of that phone as a younger kid, just to play games, but there was only one person in that house in January that would have blocked that phone, and guess who we think it might be. It's not confirmed, but that would be Melanie's. March 28th, Lori shows up in Arizona at the house. Kay and Charles are packing up his things. So Charles offers to fly Lori to Houston on March 31st to see JJ. Lori says she can't because she's made a commitment to a friend in Hawaii. Now, Adam Cox, which is Lori's brother, his ex now ex-wife, had emailed investigators later that year in August after the murders and after Charles's murder and said when Lori came back that time when Kay was there helping him pack, she did not even wait until JJ was out of school that day to see him. March 29th, Lori and Tylee go to Texas. Adam's wife said in that same email that Lori convinces Charles to move back to Arizona when she gets to Texas. In the spring, Melanie's dad notices some changes going on with her. He said her mood was flat. She would use terms light and dark spirits, used the term warrior often, and spoke of the second coming. On April 2nd, Charles emails his divorce attorney saying Lori is coming to Texas after she finishes packing in Arizona. He said there's been a lot of forgiveness and misunderstandings and ends the email with love always wins. That is actually a motto that uh, Charles's niece, Kresha, has taken up, and I think that that's very appropriate. Around April 12th, Lori goes to Houston finally to see JJ. So April 21st, apparently Lori is still in Houston at this point, and she registers a sock Yahoo account under the name Karen Walker. It's kkwalker at yahoo.com. She used a slightly different birth date than her own, but used her own phone number. And the physical address was linked to Katy, Texas, which is where she was living in Texas with Charles at the time. That account was active until June 26th. The first email was sent the day it was created, and her first email was to Chad. It says, Dear Brother Daybell, this is Karen from AVAL. I contacted you a couple of weeks ago to see if you would be willing to come speak to our youth here in Houston, Texas. 
You said you probably could if there was a way to cover your expenses. Dude, get a job, right? You lazy bum. He's making two thousand a year. T poor Tammy Daybell's working a full time job, and he's just like hopping flights on other people's dimes to satisfy the loin fire. I guess. Since then, I can't shake the feeling that you need to come share your story, particularly about chasing paradise. We are near the Houston Temple, and this summer our stake is focusing on family history work. My reason for contacting you again is that we have a stake youth conference planned for all day on Saturday, April 27th. The focus is on the temple, and I know you would energize the kids with your stories. Look. They would have to hand out like quadruple shots of espresso to energize those students if Chad's talking. I don't know if you've ever heard him talk, but he's very monotone. We expect about 400 kids to attend. So you're going to have 400 kids nodding off, right? <laughs> Including some parents. I know this is extremely short notice, but there, is there any chance you could come? A high councilman is currently the main speaker, but he said he would be happy to let you speak instead. My husband and I have been financially blessed and we would pay for your flight. We also have a house attached to ours where you could stay and not be bothered. Also, my daughter mentioned the young single adults would love to put together a fireside on Sunday evening. I realize your main goal is to sell books and that wouldn't be possible at these events, but I know that the interest in your novels would skyrocket here. I'm sorry if it's so late. It's possible If it's possible, please let me know as early as in the morning so we can include it in the Sunday announcements. Also, we would want to get your flights booked. If you're able to do both events, we would fly you in Friday, then depart on Monday. Please let me know if this is possible. We would love it. Karen Walker. Chad responds an hour later. Hello, Karen. Yes, I will be able to come, so let the wards know. I'll talk to you later about arranging the flight. Chad. So messages between Lori and Tylee around this time indicate Tylee was frustrated being left alone over the weekend and would much rather had been in Arizona. There were other emails sent from this account and most of them were invitations for Chad to listen to a song. Some of them were Let's Make Love by Faith Hill, I Dreamed a Dream from Lady Miz, and... Just Can't Get Enough by the Black Eyed Peas. Now, if you know that song, she got him feeling like... Y'all, I couldn't help it. I had to put it in. Y'all know how I am with music. She got him feeling like Mr. Roboto. <laughs> All right, so April 26th through the 29th, Chad is in Houston. Lori sends an email on the 30th thanking him for coming. All this is is a bypass so that if Tammy Daybell sees this she's not going to be suspicious in may melanie's stepmom came to visit and she would come once a year and stay like a week or so help with the kids help clean up the house but she noticed things were really different this trip uh, she noticed that the house was filthy everybody was always on their phones and melanie's would announce randomly that she was going to the temple for a couple of hours and this happened every day she visited so on May 3rd, Zulema tells Chad in a text that someone in Lori's family is going to die. On May 5th, there's a screenshot of a malachite ring found on Lori's iCloud. So we know that Lori eventually bought the malachite wedding rings her and Chad used at their wedding in Hawaii in November, just two weeks after Tammy's death. But as early as May 5th, she's looking at malachite rings. So Tammy Daybell wasn't murdered until October of 2019. May 11th, I think Charles is starting to get the idea this is not going to work. He starts visiting websites about how to file for divorce in Texas without a lawyer. On May 21st, Lori tells the group, which is Zulema, Melanie Gibb, Melanie's, and the three that kind of left early, Serena, Christina, and Nicole, that she cannot do a conference call because she's being monitored and it's not safe for her. May 27th, Lori is in Arizona. In text messages, she tells Zulema she is recording a podcast and they make plans to meet up at the temple in the celestial room where all these revelations come to her, to Lori. May 28th, Lori flies to Salt Lake City on Delta Airlines. May 29th, Zulema texts Lori, 
I will go in spirit when the bomb goes off and I'll be there to see JJ's spirit go to the presence of the Lord. Then I and the angels will protect the bodies and not allow for them to be possessed by evil. And now it's time for a word for our sponsor of the week, Lomi by Pila. Look, I've never been able to compost before. It's always too complicated, too much work, and it's too stinky. Then I got a Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with the push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter that turns scraps into dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's really quiet. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week, down from four bags to two, by the way, and I feel great knowing I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. I have basically a limitless supply of dirt for my garden. So what can you put in Lomi? Food leftovers, fruits and vegetables, eggs and eggshells, grains, coffee grounds, yard trimmings, house plants, and more. If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use the promo code what the world to get your $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash what the world and use promo code what the world at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. And then, you know, you think about it, even though this is some Harry Potter wannabe hogwash, just the fact that this woman thinks that her fake powers could kill this child makes me sick. And I don't know how. I, I, I mean, I know you can't arrest somebody for this imaginary killing of people, but I don't know how some of these people sleep at night, to be honest. And in hindsight, looking back and, and knowing that they were a part of this. A lot of people have walked back and tried to minimize their involvement, but you ain't fooling nobody. But Lori responds to Zulema, perfect. I found out there are four entities and one is a level four. His name is Iplos. The H is silent. The other three are level threes. Let's do this. So apparently Iplos had the strength of a hundred or a thousand men. Zulema says to Lori, I encapsulated them with invisible hidden capsules that will close and capture them as soon as the bombs go off and they leave their body. I also created a safe path guarded by warrior angels for Jonas to come and bind them and take them away as soon as they exit the body. I have a good feeling of this. I saw myself protecting the bodies. June 1st, Chad does a Google search for Iplos two times, by the way. Zulema text Chad, I just did some work on Iplos. I'm holding this intention and asking for the Lord to complete it. Chad says to Zulema, Lori texted me about what Julie Clement saw about Iplos looking like a dragon. Frightening, but fascinating. So on June 2nd, you get this long text chain that I'm not going to read out. It is ridiculous between Lori and Zulema where they're trying to cause Charles to wreck his truck. While he's in Texas and JJ is in the car with him, it's like, I'm sending fire. I'm sending blinding light. Oh, my God, you're a goddess. I love you. You're so powerful. And then they realize it didn't work. An investigator actually asked Zulema about these texts, and she said Chad had told Lori that Charles would be driving his truck on this trip and he would have a car accident and die. Chad told her energy needed to be put around Charles's body so another entity couldn't enter and possess it. Detective Hermosillo reminds her, this is a detective on the case, by the way, reminds her that JJ was with him and would have died if their stupid powers had worked. Lori had told Zulema that JJ would not be living for a very long time and he would pass soon because he had another mission to complete. Lori assumed he would die in the car accident too. Zulema said Lori started telling her between March and July of 2019 that JJ would pass away. She never heard Lori refer to JJ as a zombie, but she did refer to Tylee as somebody named Hillary. What? See, the, you know, I understand this band of misfits all believed this stupid stuff, but like when you're taught, when you're hearing a woman say, my kid's going to die soon, how can you hang out with these people? Why are you not going to CPS and saying this woman's off a rocker and like she's got this kid? She, you know, she sees this kid and and this is the kid's mother. I just don't get it. So in late June of 2019, Lori contacts JJ School in Arizona 
asking if he could be enrolled in their summer program. Then she asked if they could enroll him in a regular school as well. June 21st. Now, remember, Charles is murdered July 11th, so we're getting close. Lori conducted a web search for Social Security that took her to a benefits estimator. It estimated she would get $4,000 a month in benefits for JJ. Later on, after the murders, she confirms this amount to Chad in July when she finds out she's not the beneficiary because Charles changed it to his sister. One of the last things he did to stick it to Lori, and I love it. June 22nd, Lori does a podcast with Melanie Gibb and Jason Mao, the Time to Warrior Up podcast. It was called What Most Women Want. The same day, Alex starts texting Zulema. June 24th, Lori moves into the home where Charles would be murdered in. Two days later, on June 26th, Charles texts Lori's brother, Adam, asking if he could talk, and they had a telephone conversation. So at this point, Charles is involving Lori's brother, Adam, because he's listening to Charles. He's the only one in that family. Zach Cox, too, I think. But Adam is open to getting Lori help because he's worried. But on the 27th, Charles sends Adam a link that talked about translated beings and traveling to other dimensions and tells Adam this is what Lori's been talking about nonstop. Other texts indicate that Charles believed Lori had also ruined Melanie's and Brandon's marriage and said Lori needed to be stopped before she ruins other marriages. The same day, Zulema texts Lori asking if there's any way Iplos could be changed to the light. Melanie's asks Brandon for a divorce while they're visiting her dad. So her dad gets a call at 2 a.m. from Brandon asking him to come downstairs. Melanie's confirms to her dad that she wants a divorce. Brandon was blindsided. He was in shock. And so Melanie's dad spoke to the both of them individually. So Melanie shows her dad a video of Brandon on a work trip in Atlanta, and it shows Brandon dancing and there are guys around as well as other people partying. And she said Brandon was gay based on this video. And also she had a vision in the temple of a meter that went from zero to G and G represents gay. She saw the meter go all the way to G and that's how she knew. You can't make this stuff up y'all. At all. When questioned about the validity of this information by her dad, she said, I got my revel revelation. You get your own. Brandon tries to explain, look, I was the designated driver for the party on the video. It was work related. And he says, I'm not gay. On June 28th, Lori drafts an email to Chad pretending to be Charles, asking him to come to Arizona. She says, that she's acting as, as if she's Charles about wanting Chad to be a ghostwriter for a book that Charles or not really Charles, but you get what I'm saying. Um, it says that I'll be speaking at conventions, but was told it would be good to have books to sell. It says I'm willing to pay you well to be a ghostwriter and also goes on to praise Chad's writing skills. There's an invitation for Chad to come to town for a couple of days to get the book underway. It says, I played minor league baseball and have stories that people could relate to. So there's an offer to fly him down there, cover his expenses, and it ends with, with admiration, Charles. Now, Charles did play minor league baseball, by the way. June 28th, Charles texts Lori, please call me, need to speak with you about the lease. Or no, Lori texted Charles, please call me, need to speak with you about the lease. Charles texts back, no thanks, you handle it. If it costs money, just text me. Lori responds, if this is even you, does someone have your phone? These texts don't sound anything like you. Charles says, sure, Lori, it's Ned or Garrett. Take your pick. You've gone a bridge too far. Your favorite movie line is very fitting. You are a murderer of love. Lori responds, still not proof. Please call me. Charles says to Lori, I will not call you. You are too dangerous. You know, at this point, Charles really sees she is just, you know, she she's lost it. Bless his heart, man. Because, you know, the thing is, I think if Lori had it turned around, Charles would have taken her back. He loved her and he cared. 
Lori told Charles, good luck with whoever you are. Charles says, all based on lies. First hours, now Brandon and Mel. Don't forget, you just screwed up and it's redacted here. Whose life are you trying to destroy next? Now, we're going to go through a series of text messages towards the end here. And it's a little long, but it gives an idea of what I think led to the murder, ultimately. I think it was in her mind. But we get to the real reason I think Charles was murdered when he was. Lori responds, wow, you make me out to be pretty powerful to do all that. What exactly would my motivation be? More babysitting time? I think she's talking about babysitting Melanie's and Brandon's kids. They have four very beautiful kids together during the course of their marriage. Charles says, you will be stopped. Not by me, but you will be stopped. The texting continues that next day on June 29th. This is kind of a big day in the case because Charles learns about Chad because he found that email Lori sent pretending to be Charles. On June 29th, the same day, Lori's brother Adam sends Charles a message saying he had told their mother they needed to have a family meeting and hold Lori accountable for her actions. And Charles says, I will not be there for that. He said he's tried getting her help and everyone in the family except for Adam put a scarlet letter on his forehead. Charles says he knows it won't work because Lori knows she's special. And Charles mentions getting the bishop involved and says that Lori's on a very dangerous path and she's on a, thinking she's on a special mission. Thinks she's on her fifth probation, probation from Heavenly Father himself. Charles later tells Adam if Lori's mom, Melanie's, Lori's son, Colby, Tylee, or Lori's sister, Summer, knew what the meeting was about, they wouldn't even come. Charles then forwards Adam the email Lori sent to Chad, acting as if it's Charles. He says to Adam, open this letter and see what she did. I'm not sure if the relationship with her and Chad Day Daybell, but they are up to something. She created an email alias for me as I've never set this one up. She sent this yesterday and I guess she forgot all her emails are on my computer at the house. I asked her to explain it, and she started blaming you, Brandon, and me for perpetuating a scheme against her. Just more of her paranoia. She will not explain it. I'm going to send it to Chad Daybell's wife. Her name is Tammy, and I found her email address on their website. At this point, they probably still had their Spring Creek book website up with contact information. Charles goes on to say, I've got her cell number too. It sounds very suspicious to me. What do you think? Whenever she gets caught doing this kind of stuff, she starts blaming everybody else. Mostly me, you, and Brandon. Brandon and I are the victims of her craziness. I wish you luck trying to help her. I was the only one brave enough to try to get her help in January, and look what happened to me. The whole family put a scarlet letter on me. Maybe now they can see what they're up against. So Charles and Lori text back and forth. June 29th, 547 a.m. Charles texts Lori. Why would you send a letter with my name on it to your Chad? He is not staying at my house. I will be there to make darn sure he doesn't. You have literally lost your mind. You will be stopped. I'll pick up JJ on Tuesday after school. I'll bring him back Friday. And why are you creating an email address under my name? You're unbelievable. Is he with whom you're having an affair? He did not stay with us in Arizona in November. Who are you lying to now? Trying to destroy another family? You're evil, period. I may take JJ back to Houston unless you have a great explanation for all this. I will not let him be a party to this. Just so you know, I have Tammy's email address. I will send a copy of, quote, my email you sent to Tammy, and she will know what you're up to, so you better explain. All this time, Lori's not responding. I now have Tammy Daybell's cell phone number. I'll text her a copy of the letter and an explanation of what you're up to. You have till noon your time to explain, or I'm sending via text and email to her. At least now I know where all the cash went. You're unbelievable. How are you... How are you or anyone you know going to, quote, I'm willing to pay you well to help me get this book in shape as my ghostwriter? Or 
I might just go up to Idaho like you did in March and visit Tammy at her school. So clearly at this point, Charles has researched Tammy Daybell and Chad and knows she's a librarian at a school. He goes on to say, I'm sure she'd love to know the whole story of what you and her husband have been up to. Librarians aren't usually that busy. You need to explain why you're writing emails in my name. I'm sure you're up by now. You have until 10 a.m. your time to respond or I send the emails and text to Tammy. 7.09 a.m. Lori responds, call me because he's progressively gotten madder. And he's like, and then, you know, I think, too, she realizes this isn't a threat. He has done enough research to know she works at a school and things like that. And Lori says, can you please send the charger to JJ's police car? He wants to drive it, which I think is odd because you've got your estranged husband saying, I'm going to contact the wife of the man you're having an affair with and expose it. And she's deflecting and she's making it about JJ in the hopes, I think, that Charles will just say, oh, OK, yeah, well, we'll take care of JJ. Charles says, sure. Right after I send the email to Tammy, I'll get right on that. I'll bring it with me since the mail won't be there before me. I will be there Monday evening. Hack, you said, funny. All your emails are still on your computer that's here in the kitchen. Apparently, Lori might have accused him of hacking, but some things were redacted in these document dumps. That's where we got all this information. Hopefully, at trial, some, some things will be filled in. Now, Charles is not, his charges are not pending in Idaho, obviously. It's in Arizona. Cons conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. But this is all very much woven together as part of the big picture which is why number one this crash course is taking a little longer but it's super important if you're going to follow this trial and you've got to know what led up and then how this happened with charles so Lori to charles you just sent an email saying you were me apparently so yes hack charles says i sent it from your computer of course it's going to say it's you be smart Lori. you're not thinking you have until 10, as I said, to explain, or I send a note to Tammy Daybell. Lori says, good for you, bravo. Charles says, please do not use my name anymore to send emails. And Lori says, ditto. Charles says, you're not very smart. I'll send them to Tammy now if you're not going to tell me why you send an email using my name. Lori says, are you saying you did not send this signing my name today? Charles said, I kept a copy. You don't need to send me one. Yes, I sent it from your computer so the person knows what you're doing. It's not a hack. What you did is fraud. Lori says, I'm sure your companies will like to know how you sign all of your clients' names too, just like you did mine. The whole thing is fraud and it's all done by you. It's how you roll. Charles says, go right ahead. I simply asked you to help me by sending these to my clients. Not sure what they're talking about there, but it's part of it. Lori says, I know your heart and soon everyone else will too. If by knowing his heart, she means like we do now, which is seeing all the police videos and the body cam footage and him pleading. I love you. I want to help you. Or maybe our marriage ain't going to work, but you've got to get better. JJ needs you. Yeah, that's his heart. What an evil woman. Charles says, if you don't stop, you might as well move back in with Alex. I'll call Joe shortly after and tell him what a mistake we made. I'm trying to be nice and you send emails supposedly written by me to carry on your affair. You will be stopped. You need some serious help. I believe Joe might have been Charles's attorney at the time for the divorce. Lori says, do what you want. You're a big fake. And Charles says, I love you too. I love his, he gets a little snippy sometimes in here and I just love it because he's just dishing it out to her. And then he tells Lori, JJ will come back with me. Lori says, great. You are all big frauds. This is just the icing on the cake. Charles says, it'll be tough at first, but you've already abandoned him. He'll get used to it. When I get married again, he'll love his new mommy who doesn't belong in the nut house. Lori says, Sure disrupt his life again when he just got settled. I'm sure you really care about him. It's because, you know, she left him for 72 days and didn't even see him when she was in town at the halfway mark or however many 50-something days. Didn't even wait for the kid to get out of school, but I'm sure she really cared about him. 
Charles says someone has to protect him from his crazy mommy. I'm just worried you'll run off and disappear again with him. I wouldn't put it past you and your nut house friends. Lori says worry away. Charles says our biggest problem in the past has been making rushed decisions. I told you I wouldn't use the fact that I'm paying for you living in Arizona over your head. I will not do that because it's best for JJ. Stay where you are and everything will remain as it is. I'm not going to change passwords or cancel any credit cards as long as you're responsible, but there is no money for Colby or Tylee. They need to pay their own way. And if either can't afford it, then the cars will go. So they had given Colby a car. And I believe at that point, Tylee might have been driving the Jeep that belonged to Charles that comes in much later when Brandon is shot at. Charles goes on to say, Colby owes you $1,250 and Tylee owes you $250. That's part of your monthly $4,000 spending money. Too generous. Man, please don't charge anything more on the credit cards without letting me know first. I will do the same. I'm very upset with you for destroying Brandon and Mel's life along with those adorable kids. Ours too. All based on lies. It looks like you're doing it with Chad, and I'll do what I can to shine some light on your affair. I will find out why you send an email from me. Something is going on with you and Chad. I will find out, and so will Tammy. I meant, I meant it when I said you will be stopped. You cannot continue to destroy lives and think you're doing the Lord's work. You are ill, Lori, and I'm the only one brave enough and loved you enough to try to get you help. You destroyed our life. And I feel so sorry for you. Your mind is twisted as I know you still believe all those things about yourself. I will be there Monday evening and I will stay at the house with him, meaning JJ. You should probably leave Tylee too. I don't care if you stay, but just stay out of my way. Now, it's no secret that Charles and, and Tylee might have had a little bit of a step-parent, step-child relationship. It's difficult. Tylee, I don't think was able to fully trust anybody in her life due to what her mom did to her for so many years. And another thing too, Charles was probably the most stable that Tylee had in her life. And maybe it's a protection thing because Tylee knows what happens as what's happening. Now, when her mom is done with somebody, it is not some pleasant split where you do what parents do and work together and co-parent she knows it's all out war and so I often wonder with Tylee just a combination of the step-parent relationship as well as just not being able to fully give her love to somebody or accept that love because she knows the end result and by the way Charles's husband number four I mean Tylee was born to husband number three but She's seen Lori drop people quickly and, and, and how she treats them. I feel really bad for Tylee and I, my heart breaks for her in a million ways. So Charles says, explain the letter you sent or I will send it to Tammy Daybell. You have one hour and 15 minutes. He says, I imagine the state president would be real interested as to why you're sending an email with my name on it that I didn't write. Hmm, I wonder, just emailed and texted Tammy. Let's shine some light on this issue and see what we all see. He says, so now I see it. Is your cutout to get your singing and other stuff to Chad Daybell? Meaning that email address is her sock account to stay under the radar with Tammy and Charles. <laughs> Man, jeez. Interesting. I wonder what his wife will think. Now, things like this are why I say Lori was not mentally ill so much because she hid every aspect of the murders of everything, even email accounts. You can be mentally ill and very much culpable. And that is why that woman is going to be on trial in just what, 18 days, 17 days for the murder of her two children and conspiracy for Tammy Daybell. She ain't fooling nobody. So Charles says, I'd like to speak with you about the next week and JJ, nothing else. When is a good time? Lori says, just text me when you want to get him and bring him back. It's fine. Charles says, excuse me, but I'm staying there. I figured you'll be busy running around with your boyfriend writing your book so you can go stay with him. 
Interesting. You went on Allegiant to Idaho Falls on Sunday, March 3rd, and came back on Tuesday, March 5th. So I guess that was to see your boyfriend. Wow, you're amazing. You accuse me of doing what you're doing. Are you even going to deny it? That's what I thought. You are the destroyer. You blame others for what you're doing yourself. Too many people know what you're up to. You will be stopped. It won't be anywhere. I won't be anywhere near there when it happens. It's disgusting what you're doing. You need to repent and you might escape with your soul intact. Maybe, just maybe. I'm astonished at what you've become. You've destroyed our life based on a lie. You are trying to destroy Brandon's life based on a lie. And now you're carrying on with Chad Daybell all behind his wife's back. All the while, you are an insult to our faith. The fact that you believe all these things about yourself that you told me in January is bad enough. You still cash to fund whatever it is you're doing and flying around cheating on me and our faith while going to temple regularly. You obviously think all these things about yourself make you special. You are an incredible hypocrite. You make up a story about some girl I've never heard of calling you saying I cheated on you only to distract from your evil ways. You will be stopped. This much I know. I'll be there to take care of JJ. This will not end well for you. And I will be as far away as I can until I come get JJ. Just so you and Chad know, I am going to talk to Tammy in person if I have to. I've already emailed and texted her. Your game is up. Why, Lori? Why have you done this to our family? I'll never understand. Lori says, when you're done ranting and raving, I'll be happy to talk rationally to you about what's best for JJ and our divorce. That's really all I have to say. Charles says, I'm quite rational. Are you actually going to court? Lori says, no. But you clearly don't want to be married to me, so let's just do it the easiest way possible for JJ. We both love him. <laughs> You clearly don't want to be married to me? Like, really, lady? Charles says, call me and we can discuss. Sorry if the truth hurts, but what you're doing is ridiculous. I thought we were going to talk about the divorce. You keep hanging up and it'll be tougher on our boy. Lori says, uh, I'm sorry, Charles says, if I have to define it for you, then you obviously know. If you hadn't lied to the president, you wouldn't have gotten your temple recommend back. Lori says, I will talk to you if you can talk without calling me names. Um, but he's calling you the right names and it's truth. So you don't want to hear it. Charles says, I didn't call you names. Call if you want. Lori says, you called me evil. Charles said, no worries. Please don't make up any more email addresses using my name. It's really creepy. And Lori says, ditto. Charles says, ditto. I've never made an email alias under your name and sent it to a cutout to further cheating on my spouse. You email Chad, your email regarding Chad Daybell is exactly that. How exactly would you explain it? That's right. You can't. You're actually inviting and paying him substantial money to come to Arizona. That's what your letter that you wrote fraudulently in my name said. All your deeds are coming under the light. This at this point, they've been going since before 6 a.m. This is 4.01 p.m. And please let me know what JJ's school schedule is this week. What days is there no school? Lori says just the 4th. Now we're getting into July. July 4th, right? They have no school. Nicole wanted to know if he would be there on Friday. They wanted a head count, so I already told her he would be there. So let me know if he won't. Charles says, can you talk for a moment? No accusations or anything like that. I just need to ask you about a couple of things. I imagine Hector, Thor, and Jason Mao, along with everyone else at the next Preparing a People conference, will be intrigued when they read the fictitious email you sent in my name for Chad, just so he can have an excuse for his wife to go see you. And the fact that you went and visited him in early March, I can make sure everyone at the conference knows you and Chad have been going at it. I have the email of your dance videos and your songs you sent to him as well. It's going to be so much fun. Your game is up. You've lied one too many times. You've destroyed enough lives. The whole world will know about you and Chad, and I'll even send all the emails from January. I'll also include his bishop and his state president. You will pay the price for all your lies. See you next week, babe. Have a great weekend. But he 
text again. You can apologize to me for all your lies. If you do finally tell the truth, I may only go to Chad's wife. Since I've already emailed and texted her, it's too late. But I will actually go to the next conference and hand out all your lies on a thumb drive. <laughs> oh, my gosh, man. I, you know, I'm just giving Charles like a through the veil high five right now because I think I would like that dude. It's up to you. Otherwise, I'll make sure the whole world knows who you really are. Charles says, and your boyfriend, please stop spending money on the credit cards. I appreciate it. So that's it for today. Tomorrow, we will pick up on the same day when Charles emails Tammy and Chad Daybell, and we'll read those emails. So I think this was the motive right here. I think this is what set his murder into motion. Because he has found it all out. He's figured out she's having an affair. He's married. He's found the wife. He's found out that Lori has spent his hard-earned money on this slacker who has a book company making two grand a year selling his books to people in people's living rooms and stuff like that. Um, but I do think that this whole thing right here was sort of the... You know, like lit the fuse, I guess you could say. All right, guys, I'm glad I got this done again. So I'm going to get this up for you soon. Tomorrow we'll keep going. And people have been a little bit like, well, you were only supposed to do four. If if you're not needing this, it's cool to skip it. Uh, this is going to take a few more days, but a lot of people are enjoying the refresher. And I've got a lot of positive uh, feedback about it. And if you don't need it, I totally understand. Um, there are just there's so much y'all and after three years of following this case you forget stuff like these text messages where charles says i have emailed and texted tammy and i know she's a librarian things like that are very important because it shows Lori's competency i guess is a good word that she was orchestrating this stuff and she just got caught she got caught with the lies, with the money, with the affair, with everything. And then you couple that with these wackadoodle beliefs and it's just, it's a storm. And then her and Chad are like firing gasoline and just a sad story with a very, very sad ending all the way around. But we're going to roll the justice bus up in Boise for Pretty Lies and Long Crime next month to watch justice play out and i'll be bringing it to you every night here hopefully if we get the audio like you know not 72 hours after it's put out there what oh i'm about to say a bad word it, it's a crap show y'all all right we'll see you soon have a good rest of your night